I always accepted that China and its leadership were not to be trusted for its authoritarian government. But now we are seeing this chessboard of alliances change. Uh, we have seen an, an alarming China in the past decade taking over our islands and our government has been mute or they make empty blowhard gestures. The country's history of resisting and defying colonization is all here in our library. We may have eventually capitulated or lost, but we had, we had put up a fight from Lapu-Lapu to Aguinaldo uh, to People's Power. The country's history of resisting and defying colonization, is, uh, the takeover of our islands and the government's insipid response and the muffled reactions of our citizens brings us to this important book, Rock Solid by Marites Vitog. This book allows us to step back and soberly review events leading to the rise of Chinese imperialism in keeping with their new economic power. We shall understand our preceding government's response, which led to a very daring move, a fight not with swords or guns, but in modern parlance to bring the case to court. We would argue our sovereignty, and we actually won it. This book, therefore, is so important, not just as historical narrative, but as a solid calling for us citizens to be activists again, as we and our ancestors have done before. There is a prevailing narrative coming from China, from the Filipino business community in league with Chinese commercial allure, from our own president, uh, who, like President Trump, is, an is enamored with macho power and authoritarian impulses. That prevailing narrative uh, tells us to give up this thing called nationalism. It's a 19th century invention, they say. Instead, we should get with the times. We're one world now, and the picking is for the powerful. And there will be, assuredly, some leftovers for us, the natives. We have, though, this book, Rock Solid, to set us straight. So may I call Marita Sito. Thank you very much, John, for laying the context. And uh, good afternoon to everyone. Thank you for coming. And uh, I'm going to give a talk based on my book. So. Uh, then we'll have a question and answer after this. So let me begin in the year 2016, that's two years ago, and let's go back to the events that happened at the time. Uh, I think you still remember this. On the evening of July 12, 2016, journalists gathered in the press room of the Department of Foreign Affairs, waiting for Foreign Secretary Perfecto Yasai to give the first official reaction of the Philippines to its sweeping victory in The Hague. A couple of hours earlier, the Permanent Court of Arbitration had announced the tribunal's decision, releasing the 500-page award on its website. It showed it, the ruling was the Philippines won overwhelmingly and China's 9 dash line was declared illegal. So anyway, the reporters were all in the room, the air was heavy with anticipation, and then a hushed silence descended on the room as Yasai stood before the podium to read a prepared statement. And this was to be carried live on national TV. But as the photo shows, this was the actual photo of July 12, 2016, he appeared sad with no trace of a smile on his face. And he read a statement I'll read the excerpt from the statement. He said, The Philippines welcomes the issuance today of the award by the arbitral tribunal. 
Our experts are studying the award with care and thoroughness that this significant our virtual outcome deserves. In the meantime, we call on all those concerned to exercise restraint and sobriety. The Philippines strongly affirms its respect for this milestone decision as an important contribution to ongoing efforts in addressing disputes in the South China Sea. The decision upholds international law, particularly the 1982 UNCLOS. The Philippines reiterates its abiding commitment to efforts to pursue the peaceful resolution and management of disputes with a view to promoting and enforcing peace and stability in the region. This was the first official statement to a huge award that was wherein we won overwhelmingly and internationally it was recognized as a landmark case. So with this deliberate manner, Yasai took up three minutes to read the four paragraph statement after which he hurriedly left. So the reporters were quite frustrated because he didn't want to answer questions. The next day, a columnist for CNBC wrote, and I quote, Without any other context, you might have thought Yasai was delivering a eulogy. End of quote. So, in another part of town, in his home, former Foreign Affairs Secretary Jose René Almendras, who was Foreign Secretary in the last few months of the Aquino government, watched Yasai on TV. He did not sense a whiff of elation in the statement, not even a hint of joy. Yet this was the culmination of the first ever international arbitration case on the South China Sea, and which gave the Philippines its shining moment. Under Almendras, they already had a scenario planned in case of victory. They were expecting the decision to come out before Aquino stepped down on June 30, 2016. So their scenario for victory was DFA was going to issue a statement that would reflect the significant gains of the Philippines. Celebratory in tone as it would celebrate the rule of law as a means to settle disputes and achieve peace. And then the statement would call for international support for compliance with the ruling because as we know there is no global policeman to enforce the ruling. The predecessor of Almendras was Albert Del Rosario, under whose watch the arbitration case was filed. When, before he stepped down because of uh, health reasons, he had already talked with various representatives of foreign governments for statements of support if the Philippines won, including ASEAN, EU, Japan, US, um, North America, uh, India. So these countries were expected to follow after the Philippines released its own statement. So the countries were going to take the cue from the Philippines. Unfortunately, no, only this statement of Yasai came out and no other statement followed. So countries sympathetic to the Philippines did not issue statements because there was no cue from the Philippines. Near Manila Bay, hundreds gathered to celebrate, released balloons, and tossed flowers in the air hours before the ruling was released. When news on the victory spread, hashtag checks, checks it, short for China exit, rippled on Twitter. In another part of town, in Makati, yeah, this thing, are the demonstrators outside the Chinese embassy waved colorful streamers, as you can see. China, in all caps, China, respect the rights of our fishermen. Check it, China out of PH waters. In this photo, you can see them carry a makeshift fishing boat with a Philippine flag planted on it. Emblazoned on the boat was China out of PH territory. But all this celebration only lasted for a day. So what happened? So before we go to the story uh, of the case, let, I'll just give you a brief uh, rundown of definitions and also later the maps. <coughs> because people have been asking, what's the difference between South China Sea, Spratly Islands, or Kalayaan Island Group? As you will read in the book, 
uh, Spratly Islands is just a part of uh, South China Sea. Kalayan Island Group was declared by President Marcos uh, in the 70s to be, in 1978, to be part of the Philippines. And then recently, under uh, President Aquino, uh, parts of South China Sea was named, was called, was renamed or called by the Philippines West Philippine Sea. This is not the entire South China Sea. As we see, South China Sea is much, much bigger and bordered by different countries. And these maps are all available. You can download them for free. Uh, I downloaded them, this from the book of Justice Carpio, an e-book, which is free. You can just download the maps. Uh, later, I'll look for the title of the book. That's South China Sea. This is the Kalayaan Island Group and the Spratly Islands. Okay. So now, um, I'd like to go to a bit about the present. What's happening under the present administration? <coughs> it has been two years since the Philippines won overwhelmingly in, its, in our maritime dispute against China. But during this time, the official narrative in the country has been one with strong defeatist tones. From day one, July 12, 2016, when the tribunal issued its decision invalidating the Nine Dash Line and clarifying the status of certain features in the South China Sea, this ruling was never given the national attention it deserved. It has not been used as leverage in the country's dealings with China it has not been part of the country's diplomatic arsenal. Since 20, July 2016, the award has been brought up with China twice in bilateral consultations, twice in two years. Foreign Secretary Alan Cayetano revealed this during a recent congressional hearing called by the Special Committee on the West Philippine Sea. This is what the government says. We won, yes, uh, the Defense Secretary says it's an empty victory, and the President and uh, the Foreign Affairs Secretary say China is our source of economic deliverance. China will rebuild war-torn Marawi. It will invest heavily in the government's build, build, build program. Millions of Chinese tourists will boost our tourism industry, and China is our new source of weapons. And unlike the EU, China is a dear friend because they are nonchalant about the deadly drug war that has killed thousands and has led to a tidal wave of impunity. So these drown out the gains of July 12, 2016, weakening the Philippine position. It makes our country part of the chorus of approval of China in the region. So today, as a journalist, with this book, I'd like to present a different narrative so that the public is not um, convinced or taken by the official story. Again, as a journalist, I think it's time we talk about a narrative that takes us, takes us back to the story of Philippines versus China, the historic arbitration case that was celebrated in various parts of the world. It's time we go back to the almost two decades of back and forth with Beijing when our diplomats asserted Philippine rights over parts of the South China Sea, only to be rebuffed with a stock response that China had indisputable sovereignty over this vast area. With this book, I hope it's time we review the award or the decision. And also, it's time we hear from experts, from diplomats, from the public, on how to make use of our legal victory and start a national conversation on this vital issue. So people ask me, why? Why this book? I take a leaf from what a foreign commentator wrote soon after July 2016, and I quote, Having seized control of the narrative, Manila must hang on to it the Philippines must tell its story and tell it often. So in my new book, Rock Solid, 
I tell the story of this victory that gave the country so much. Physically, a maritime area larger than the total land area of the Philippines, rich in resources. But this victory has since been disregarded by the government. <coughs> Let's review why the case is historic. And I'll cite four reasons. First, it, it, it was a novel case. It was the first to interpret the onclos definitions of rocks, islands, and low tide elevations. It is the first case to be filed by a South China Sea claimant state against China. It is the first time the Philippines ever sued a country. The Philippines has sued corporations, but never a country. Number four, it is the first case to address the scope and application of the UNCLOS provision on protection and preservation of the environment. As the Philippine lawyer said, international environmental law was still an infant when UNCLOS was negotiated. So also in this book, it will help us understand why President Aquino decided to take China to court. At the time, uh, there was discussion in the cabinet and in the media. A number of people had openly opposed the arbitration, saying it would do more harm than good to our relations with China. A prominent lawyer who was part of our Philippine delegation to UNCLOS under President Marcos when we, were, uh, set, when we sent a negotiating team, this lawyer even called for a withdrawal of the case as the country was awaiting the decision of the tribunal. Estelito Mendoza said that we sh the, um, the country should withdraw to give the incoming president, Duterte, latitude in dealing with China as Aquino was to step down on Ju in June 30, 2016. And also, this may be a little known fact, but on the day Aquino was inaugurated president in 2010, China sent him a formal invitation for a state visit the first country to do so. This was the first day of Aquino in office. It showed how strongly China wished to woo the new leader and continue the golden years it had enjoyed with his predecessor, President Arroyo, now current Speaker of the House. Such timely memories. Reflecting on his early years as President, Aquino said he wanted to have very good relations with China since it was increasingly becoming an economic superpower. But two things shaped, China, shaped Aquino's views on China. First, in 2011, this was uh, um, the second year of Aquino in office, China stopped Philippine survey ships in Reed Bank or Recto Bank. The ships had less than two weeks to go before they could finish their survey, but China stopped them. A year later, in 2012, China took control of Scarborough Shoal after a one month and a half standoff. It was a very tense confrontation over fishing rights. As you will see in the book, I devoted a whole chapter on this exciting and uh, dangerous episode in our relations with China. A series of near, co near collisions took place between Philippine and Chinese ships. Much later, the tribunal ruled that China's provocations caused this, violating regulations on good seamanship. During the Scarborough standoff, for, uh, during this time, as you will read in the book, China sent all, like an armada of ships, while the Philippines had only two ships. But at any one point, one operating ship, because the other was a reserve. So anyway, when I interviewed uh, Aquino, he said that he remembers pretty well what a senior ASEAN leader told him, and I quote, There are big countries and there are small countries. That's the way of the world. So he said he mulled over this and thought it was precisely the law that would serve as the great equalizer. So after these two major incidents and he uh, had discussions with the cabinet, he decided that the Philippines, it's, it was time the Philippines sue China because he considered the law, international law, as a great equalizer. So in January 2013, 
the Philippines began its legal battle. More than a year later, the Philippines submitted its memorial, which is equivalent to a plea, and this reached more than 3,000 pages. It was a product of massive research in history, international law, geology, marine biodiversity, hydrography, and cartography. This included 10 volumes of annexes which contained maps, nautical charts, expert reports, witnesses affidavits, historical records, official communications. If you're really interested, you can download this for free from the website of the Permanent Court of Arbitration. I think all except the maps, because they're quite heavy. So we, we gave 170 maps to the tribunal. So as I went over this annexes, I saw written exchanges between the Philippines and China, including notes verbal starting from the mid-1990s, when China grabbed mischief free. All these were made public when the Philippines filed a case versus China. This included intelligence reports of the Navy, the Western Command of the Armed Forces, the National Defense Department. It's a fascinating trove of our country's diplomatic history. Um, again, if you're into history, you will see the originals, the intelligence documents, the memos, the notes verbal. And it is good to be reminded that it was the Philippines which hosted the first bilateral consultations that focused on the South China Sea in August 1995. We initiated this. I just wanted to remind ourselves that we did this because recently, under President Duterte, uh, Cayetano said that we're going to have our first bilateral consultation on South China Sea with China, but this happened already in 1995. Also, on the, in the website of the Permanent Court of Arbitration, you can find transcripts of the oral hearings, which capture the essential points of the case. The Philippine lawyers uh, was led by Paul Riker and his team at Foley Hope, an American law firm based in Washington, D.C., and they used the richly documented diplomatic history of the Philippines-China dispute in their arguments before the, the tribunal. The transcripts, the awards, which are the decisions, are accessible reading to non-lawyers like me. So, again, if you're really interested, it's very helpful to go to the original documents. Now, outside the Philippines, in 2016, the Philippines versus China case reverberated in forums, in lectures, blogs, and journals. As I was doing research, I was amazed at the no countless opinions, analysis, news reports in the media in various capitals of the world, uh, whether Europe, uh, North America, Asia. I really felt that it was a much-awaited award, a case that elicited extraordinary attention. So here a professor um, at the University of Geneva Faculty of Law said this, um, and nobody in, in the Philippine government has said this till today, that July 12, 2016 is a date that will remain etched in the history of international adjudication. The second line of his quote was, the award was an undeniable judicial, judicial victory for the Philippines. Noel Bautista, a Philippine law professor teaching in an Australian university, wrote that this is the first international litigation initiated by a claimant state in the South China Sea. He called it a bold move, a game changer, which has altered the terrain of strategies available to claimant states that have always eschewed legal options. More accolades came from overseas. In London, one of the, it's not here, but one of the Philippine councils, Philip Sands, put in some perspective <coughs> and said, he told The Guardian in an interview, this is the most significant international legal case for almost the past 20 years since the Pinochet judgment. Closer to home, the comments of Singapore Prime Minister Lee Shen Lung were remarkable 
because this departed from the usually subdued tones of Southeast Asian leaders when they talk about other members of ASEAN. While visiting the U.S., he was asked about the Philippines versus China case, and he replied, the ruling of the tribunal has made a strong statement on what the international law is. It's an impartial, objective, peaceful way of resolving <coughs> issues. Japan, which has been very supportive of the Philippines arbitration move, was also openly uh, praising the Philippines and the rule of law. One ambassador said, Shingo Yamagami, he called it a historic decision which will have sustained power. The ruling is going to be the litmus test of the rule of law in East Asia. And he went on. He, this ambassador came to the Philippines and spoke uh, in 2016. And he said, uh, we do not want to see bullying. We do not want to see a world where only might prevails. And he addressed the Filipinos whom he spoke with. And he said, you might feel lonely standing at the front line, but you are not alone. So now, after all these accolades, I'd like to uh, bring you to the case itself. So it was only in 2009 when China made official its U-shaped nine-dash line clay. Uh, John has a map actually there. He bought from National Bookstore a globe which shows the nine-dash line claim of China. It was only in 2009 when China submitted this official nine-dash line claim to the UN. China has always been saying that they have historic rights but actually, this was found to have no legal basis. It was like fiction woven from thin air, like arbitrarily drawing boundaries over existing maps. In his opening speech in The Hague, former, ambassador, former Secretary of Foreign Affairs, the Rosario said, described the Nine Dash Line as a burning wall of the sea, a giant fence owned by and excluding everyone but China itself. The tribunal conducted a total of seven days of hearings, three on jurisdiction issues, meaning did the tribunal have um, jurisdiction over the case, and four days on the merits themselves. These hearings were held more than a year apart, so it took the tribunal more than three years to resolve the case. This is Paul Reichler, who headed uh, the Philippine team of lawyers. It included um, <coughs> an legal academics from the UK and also one from the US, apart from his team at Foley Home. His firm hired an expert cartographer to help draw the maps because they made legal arguments using pictures. And through the maps, the Philippines was able to show the outrageousness of China's claims. But more importantly, Paul said, that this, there is nowhere on earth where the Philippines can stand up against China, except in a court or international tribunal. And if you believe in justice for those who are the worst victims of justice internationally, then a career as an international lawyer gives you a chance to do something. Uh, a little <coughs> introduction on Reichler, a background rather, he, made, uh, he defended Nicaragua against the U.S., I think in the 80s, and he won. So from then on, he has been taking uh, the cases of the underdogs, and he has won most of his cases in international courts. <coughs> to put the issues in perspective for us in the Philippines and abroad, Supreme Court Justice Carpio warned that the country was facing the gravest external threat to the Philippines since World War II. In his speeches, he said that the root cause of the South China Sea dispute was the claim of China for its nine dash lines, which gobbled up large areas of the EEZ, EEZs of the Philippines, Vietnam, Malaysia, Brunei, and Indonesia. This area, this claimed area of China, enclosed 85.7% of the entire South China Sea. For the Philippines alone, this covered 80% of its EEZ, a huge maritime space which Carpio depicted in numbers. 
over 531,000 square kilometers larger than the land area of the Philippines, which is only 380,000 square kilometers. So this was what was at stake. Either the Philippines keep it or lose it to China. This was one of the um, motivating factors also for the president, for Kino, to decide to, go, uh, to take China to court. So when the Philippines filed its case, five judges who hailed from different, par different parts of the world unanimously arrived at the decision. The, these judges come from uh, I think Europe and Africa. The Chinese, China was complaining that there was none from Asia. Initially, there was a judge appointed from Asia. He was from Sri Lanka, but he had to withdraw because his wife was a Filipina and there was bound to be a conflict of interest. So anyway, there's one, um, they came to compose the uh, team and combine. This was where the hearings were held in the Peace Palace in The Hague. This is the biggest room in the Peace Palace. Uh, this is the, where the International Court of Justice holds its hearings. This was not assigned to the Philippine case, but uh, when they saw the number of interested uh, observers, plus the huge delegation from the Philippines, they had to move to this biggest room. But as you see, uh, there's an empty table because the Chinese did not participate in the case. So combined the experiences of the judges in adjudicating law of the sea disputes spanned many deca decades. These judges have, had written uh, texts and books on UNCLOS and they're very well respected in their fields. So that's why uh, Paul Reichler told me in an interview that when the judges were named, they felt very confident that they would get a fair decision because of the reputation of these five men. And also, uh, since Reichler and his team, they're not just advocates, they're not, they don't just argue before the court. Some of them also <coughs> sit as judges in arbitral tribunals. So, the Philippines chose a very um, uh, brilliant team for its case. So as we, now, as we all know, and we, keep, we need to be reminded, we won on both jurisdiction and merits. The tribunal accepted the case because they said at its core, the Philippines sought an interpretation of the definitions of islands and rocks by the UNCLOS, and the extent of surrounding waters these were entitled to. The tribunal agreed with most of the Philippines' arguments, 13 out of 15, which essentially covered five key issues. And the five judges ruled this way. I'm just uh, summarizing it and trying to understand it from a lay person's point of view. So China's nine-dash nine line claim is illegal. The tribunal said that their historic Rights claim is not compatible with the UNCLOS provisions. And they said there is no evidence that China had historically exercised exclusive control over the waters or their resources. Number two, on the entitlements to maritime areas, none of the Spratly Islands is capable of generating extended maritime zones and none of the features claimed by China is capable of generating an exclusive economic zone. What this means um, is that, in other words, none of the Philippines' entitlements are overlapped by any of China's, giving the Philippines the exclusive enjoyment of their resources in these areas. The, the tribunal also ruled that China ruled that China had violated the Philippines' sovereign rights in its EEZ by interfering with Philippine fishing and petroleum exploration, constructing artificial islands, and failing to prevent Chinese fishermen from fishing in the zone. Fishermen from the Philippines, like those from China, had traditional fishing rights at Scarborough Shoal, and China had interfered with these rights in restricting access. 
In fact, China law enforcement vessels had unlawfully created a serious risk of collision when they physically obstructed the vessels, the Philippine vessels. And on the environmental issue, we also won overwhelmingly. Uh, the tribunal said that China had caused severe harm to the coral reef environment. And the tribunal said that, in fact, in a very scolding tone, if you read the decision, the tribunal said that the Chinese authorities were aware that their fishermen had harvested endangered sea turtles, corals, and giant clams on a substantial scale, but they did not stop their fishermen from doing this. And the last, uh, the last item in the ruling, the tribunal said that China's large-scale land reclamation, dredging, and construction of artificial islands were incompatible with the obligations of a state during dispute resolution proceedings. The tribunal said that China permanently destroyed evidence of the natural condition of features in the South China Sea. So... Uh, I would just like to add that our lawyers had a more difficult time uh, defending the Philippine case because of the absence of China. The tribunal wanted all doubts about their um, fairness uh, set aside, so they made our Philippine lawyers do a lot of extra work. Um, they, as Reitler said, they acted as China's lawyers, so they gave additional requirements, questions. That's why the case extended for some time. But overall, the impact of the ruling, it removed cobwebs of doubt on the nature of the features in the South China Sea and what belonged to the EEZ of the Philippines. So if, be if before the case we had a larger disputed area, after the case, after we won the case, the disputed area had shrunk to not more than 1.5% of the 3.5 million square kilometers of maritime space in the South China Sea. This is a quote from uh, Justice Carpio. So after the case, the Philippines reaped huge rewards. A small country with feeble military muscle won in an international court, notching gains for a case it built based on history and the law of the sea forged by 167 states for <coughs> four years. And to remind again, China was one of the UNCLOS signatories, but it chose to stay outside it because it insisted that it had indisputable sovereignty over the South China Sea. And also during the hearings of the case in The Hague, the court, the tribunal sent the Chinese embassy in The Hague reports, uh, transcripts of the hearings, all the Philippine submissions were physically delivered to the Chinese embassy, but they, were ne they never uh, responded because they took the position that the tribunal had no jurisdiction over the case. Now I'd like to refresh our memories a bit. I I'll show a short timeline on why in reality it was China which pushed the Philippines to sue them in an international tribunal. 1988, that was the beginning, and China occupied some of the reefs, and uh, if you look at the photos today, they have been transformed into military bases. Um, you can always check this at the very, this is a, there's a very uh, updated website, the Asia Maritime Transparency Initiative, this is based in Washington, D.C. They have updated satellite photos on all the features in South China Sea. In 1995, this is what uh, is more contemporary history under President, this happened under President Ramos, when China grabbed mischief free. We were all caught unaware. And it was in 1995 that President Ramos and, and the Philippines decided to run to ASEAN for help. This was the first time that ASEAN supported the Philippines against China and made a statement about China's grab of Mischief Reef. Again, if you look at the photos today, um, Mischief Reef, which just used to have 
shelters for fishermen, according to, the, to China. Now it's a military base complete with underground storage for ammunition. Again, if you, I devoted an entire chapter to this in the book, which was very interesting because when the DFA under Secretary Romulo, uh, Roberto Romulo at the time, called the attention of the Chinese to, protect the gra to protest the occupation of Mischief Reef, the Chinese said, these are just fishermen. And uh, eventually the, they were forced to say that, oh yes, we just, there's a small uh, military shelter that eventually this grew and has, is now a complete military base. 2004 and 2005, if you remember, the Philippines and China entered into a joint marine seismic undertaking, which became very controversial. The aim was to do a three-year research of petroleum resources in parts of the South China Sea. Vietnam protested. Uh, they were very angry at this uh, bilateral arrangement. And so uh, eventually Vietnam was included and it became a trilateral agreement. I also devote an entire chapter to this, and China was the one which really, I think, dominated the survey. They used it. China used its own ship and collected the data, and Vietnam supposedly processed it, and the Philippines interpreted it. The survey results are supposedly with the Department of Energy, but I think nobody has seen much of it. Anyway, a case questioning the JMSU constitutionality is still pending in our Supreme Court. That's how long it takes for a case to be decided. In 2011, this is recent, this was under the time already of President Aquino, when uh, China, China stopped our Philippine survey ships from exploring for oil and gas in Reed Bank or Recto Bank. And then the next year, this was the peak of the tension and the crisis between China and the Philippines when it took control of Scarborough Shoal. And then the most recent, 2013, 2014, China attempted to prevent again our ships from delivering supplies and from rotating personnel in Ayumin Shoal. Ayumin Shoal is guarded by a a ship that's grounded, deliberately grounded there, but it's now uh, in a state of uh, disrepair. So recently, again, under Duterte, there was an attempt to prevent, again, our Philippine soldiers from delivering supplies to Ayunin. So that's the timeline, but uh, if you go over the entire 1995 to 2013 Manila-Beijing exchanges, you will realize the futility of uh, discussing this issue in a bilateral uh, setting. So now, on, I just wanted to introduce a little known fact that six fishermen helped the Philippines win its case. Four of them came from Masinlok uh, in Zambales. That was on the front lines of the struggle against China's aggression. And the two were from Infanta, Pangasinan. Uh, these are two of the four fishermen, and they, uh, they were interviewed by the Office of Solicitor General, and they did their own affidavits, which were translated into English, and which were submitted to the tribunal. So these are the two other fishermen from Masindok. Masindok, if you go there, you can see the outlines of Scarborough Shoal, and it takes anywhere from 9 to 13 hours by motorized boat, to reach the shoal which the Chinese grabbed in 2012. And some of them, some of these uh, fishermen were sprayed at the time with water cannons. When I visited them uh, in 20, this was during the time of Duterte, they were already able to fish around Scarborough Shoal, but they were not allowed to enter into the lagoon, which they used to do before. However, if the there's a storm or the weather is bad, the Chinese allow them to go inside. And actually they have, uh, they seem to be very well informed about this issue. And one of them told me that, how come we can't go back to the original arrangement? We're in, you know, we're in control. 
uh, yes, we're allowed to fish around, but we still have to ask permission to the Chinese to enter the, the good. But still, uh, at least it helps them in their income and their children continue to fish. Because during the time that they were disallowed, some of them became security guards and their incomes were very much affected. So, and if you talk to these fishermen, and also it is shown in our Philippine memorial, the supporting record showed that their Chinese counterparts used dynamite and cyanide fishing in Scarborough Shoal and also in Ayungin. It's a very common practice among the Chinese, and the Philippines also used a BBC video to show how uh, a Chinese vessel was um, harvesting giant clams. And this BBC reporter researched and found out that these giant clams sell for a hefty price you know, on the internet. Um, so it's a good source of livelihood. Now again in our memorial, in our pleading, we pointed out that despite repeated protests from the Philippines, China never stopped its fishermen from engaging in environmentally unsound practices. So uh, this env the environmental angle in the Philippine case was uh, a very strong point as well in our submission. So now I'd like to s share with you, in conclusion, lessons that can be learned from other international cases wherein one of the states did not participate. This is not the first time that a state did not participate in a case before an international tribunal. Nicaragua versus U.S. What Nicaragua did when the U.S. failed to comply with the ruling of the International Court of Justice, uh, at that time the U.S. was funding the Contra rebels, if you remember because the, uh, Reagan wanted to topple the Sandinista-led government. And uh, Paul Reichler defended uh, uh, Nicaragua against the U.S. So when the case filed by Nicaragua reached the merits phase, the U.S. declined to participate. So the International Court of Justice ruled against the U.S. and ordered it to pay reparations. Uh, the U.S. ignored Nicaragua's request for negotiations on compensation and still continued to support the contrast. So here's what Nicaragua did. They went to the U.N. Security Council to seek a resolution to urge the U.S. to heed the World Court's decision. But they failed because the U.S. was a permanent member of the Council and vetoed it. So they went to another body in the UN, UN General Assembly. And here they succeeded. The General Assembly adopted four resolutions calling for full and immediate compliance with the judgment of the International Court. So overall, Nicaragua did not succeed in getting the US to fully comply with the judgment, but the litigation was not useless because the US eventually provided Aid, they called it aid instead of reparations to the new government in Nicaragua. I just learned recently after I wrote the book, when I was listening to Justice Carpio speak, that he said the plan of the Philippine government at that time under Aquino was if, since there's no global enforcement of the ruling, I just learned that the plan was also to go to the General Assembly and uh, do what Nicaragua did every year, you know, file a resolution calling for um, compliance. And this will, um, the, the aim is to get international support and to let the world know of the Philippines' um, struggle and victory. And then uh, there was another study which looked at the case of Netherlands versus Russia. This is called the Arctic Sunrise Case and Russia refused to participate in a suit filed by the Netherlands. In 2013, it was Russia which seized the ship called Arctic Sunrise, which was flying the Dutch flag. And its crew was a crew of Greenpeace activists. So the ITLOS, International Tribunal on the Law of the Sea, asked, ordered Russia to release the ship and allow the non-Russian crew members to leave the country. At first, Russia uh, stalled, but eventually implemented 
most of the measures required by ITLOS. They just changed the, uh, the wording. They, Russia said that they were doing this because they were following domestic legislation, not the ITLOS ruling. So the Arctic Sunrise and the crew were released, but Russia, unfortunately, had not yet paid compensation to the Netherlands. So uh, as we see, uh, decisions from international tribunal take time to be enforced and fulfilled. So in the case of the Philippines, I think we should not lose hope because making that tribunal ruling work, at least seeing it come to fruition partly or fully, will take a long time, way beyond a single president's term. So there is still hope if the next administration uh, will be supportive of this legal victory. And it will require strategic thinking anchored on a strong sense of justice, equity, and sovereign rights. So thank you for listening and good day.